Okay, let's get this started. Good morning. Put my glasses on so I can see some stuff. Good morning. Welcome to my Saturday morning special Backyard Professor Live. Uh, I have some breaking news and I want to somewhat discuss this. It's early Saturday morning. <clears throat> Probably not a lot of people are going to know I do this. Sorry, it's on the cuff or it's off the cuff. <laughs> but, uh, wow, my hair looks... Oh, I forgot to comb my hair. Oh, well, it is Saturday morning. That's my excuse. Now, tomorrow night, I will be doing a live session also on uh, some more uh, Book of Mormon archaeology. Hey, Splunky Doink, how you doing? Mark Crispin. Good morning, you guys. <clears throat> I'm a little froggy this morning. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Still getting over my COVID stuff. Whew. That's nasty stuff. Don't get it if you can help it. Okay. Let me get started. I don't know how how much time of yours I'll take. I do just want to touch bases on a couple of things that have just recently happened. Thursday night, Daniel C. Peterson from Farms Fame, the editor of the Review of Books, the sarcastic, witty, charming, insulting uh, man who was ousted out of his role in Farms gave a fireside in Calgary, Canada. And in that fireside, just last Thursday, just a night and a half ago, uh, he described what he calls the, he billed it as the current state of Book of Mormon scholarship. And he went through an entire litany of issues. Uh, in fact, I will. <clears throat> hey, Wendy Rowland, good morning. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. So we we have a uh, we have an issue here where I asked myself after listening to uh, Peterson went on for about an hour and fifteen minutes or so. Very amiable, friendly, wonderful. It was a Zoom. And so I was able to join the group on Zoom. I did not make any comments. I simply, I have some recorded sections that I will share with you here this morning. Uh, just a couple of moments, uh, a couple of minute, two or three clips of Peterson that I do want to address. <clears throat> However, here is his litany of current scholarship issues, which he brought out. And I mean, it was a whole shotgun approach. It was pretty impressive in some respects. He discussed early modern English in the Book of Mormon, stylometry showing various different authors. He described the witnesses, of course. That was his first opening salvo, was the three witnesses and the eight witnesses. And then he talked about the pace of translation. Uh, he described seismology and volcanoes. He described olive culture as discussed in the Book of Mormon, the execution of Zemnariha, rhetorical density, Gadiat and robbers and guerrilla warfare, ancient warfare, chiasmus, Benjamin's speech and the Feast of Tabernacles, Mesoamerican archaeology, the idea of concrete. Uh, he described Bountiful, then he brings up Nahum, and then he brings up the Heavenly Council's theme and the if-and conditionals in Hebrew, and then the Mesoamerican timekeeping, the Bakhtuns and the Katuns, <clears throat> the 20-year and 400-year items. And then he talked about the name Alma, and he talked about the land of Jerusalem, simile curses, what was a Moshiach. He talked about Christopher Columbus and the land of Jerushon. <clears throat> now, these are all in rather older apologetic literature uh, from, from basically two books 
called Echoes and Evidences of the Book of Mormon, which Farms put together in the 1990s, and then re-exploring the Book of Mormon, which was a combination of their insights, their ideas and themes on updating the Book of Mormon again in the 1990s. Well, this is, from my standpoint now, from a former apologetic standpoint, I would see this as Mormon apologetics refusing to give the other side uh, concerning difficulties and criticisms, uh, but he did impress his audience, and that's why he did this fireside, because it's all about building up faith and testimony. Now, technically speaking, there is nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that, because that's what I do, too. I build up faith and knowledge-seeking evidence just on the other side of apologetics in so many regards. <clears throat> Did I find Dr. Peterson's evidence persuasive? No, not in the least. Unfortunately, and, and this is unfortunate, uh, Dr. Peterson has been talked to about so very many of these evidences, and he knows that he is using outdated information. And there has been new analysis that have been brought forward that show the so-called hits, or what they like to call bull's eyes for the Book of Mormon. These are not accurately described in the apologetic arena because they are not bullseyes and they are not hits. And new evidence has actually come forward, new translations of ancient texts, retranslations of ancient names, new archaeological evidence, which I will also bring forward tomorrow night in my Sunday live session also on Book of Mormon archaeology. But this new information is being ignored by the apologists, and they stick ironically now. And this is so weird. They stick with the outdated materials because back then, the outdated materials were faith promoting were testimony. And of course, Peterson does the typical Mormon thing. Well, you know, the strongest evidence is the Holy Ghost testifying to you is true, but we do have some really good evidences. And the plain brute hard fact is they do not have good evidences. Not at all. And, and this is serious. Uh, this is one of the things that basically drove me out of Mormon apologetics because I was <clears throat> seeing this upgrading of knowledge. Now, that's what you do properly to find the realistic probability of whether an evidence supports your theory or not. See, that's the Bayesian theorem. I did a video, one of my first live, one of my first videos I ever did since joining the Mormon Discussion Inc group was on this name Alma and the use of Bayes' theorem to upgrade our knowledge in order to get a realistic probability. Dan Peterson refuses to upgrade, and so I'm going to once again, and Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon on Mormonism Live, The Nature of Mormon Apologetics, that session, they decimated the apologetic concepts on Alma. And then I did my follow-up. Well, I'm doing another follow-up because as of July 14th, 2022, Daniel Peterson continues to use the outdated information and he knows it's outdated. He has been talked to. He's he's well-read. He's an intelligent man. He is doing this with Mormon audiences who are not aware of the 
contextual discussion back and forth. See, basically, since the Mormons create their own scholarly journals so that they can publish their own so-called evidences, which don't really work out, in favor of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith, prophecy, current prophets and leaders, etc., they don't get peer-reviewed properly. So my videos, Mormonism live videos, John DeLynn's Mormon stories videos, the Mormon Think website, Reddit has a boatload of materials from former Mormons and current Mormons and scholars, etc. The Mormons don't do proper peer review for themselves so that the rest of us do so. And they are ignoring the peer review. Now, we have the famous uh, argument between Phil Jenkins and Bill Hamblin on the Nahum follies. True to form, Peterson brings up Nahum, and I'll show you that clip. I'll show you the clip on Alma. I have it videoed, uh, copied, uh, so that I can comment on it, so that you can see for yourself how Daniel Peterson puts the information. That way I can't be accused of putting words in his mouth. I'll let him do the talking. And then I will respond with solid evidence. So it's unfortunate that in a way this lopsided approach by the Mormon apologists simply does not carry conviction. It can't. Because those of us who want to remain better informed, to stay in the loop of current status evidences for the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, etc., are seeing that so many of the early evidences which Mormon apologetics brought out in the, say, the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, so many of these have been outdated, and the apologists do not want to acknowledge that. They do not move forward, and they remain backwards. And yet they keep saying, well, the Holy Ghost has testified to me that the Book of Mormon is true, and I, I don't think they know what the hell the Holy Ghost is. I really don't, because there's no way, given the definition of the Holy Ghost, that it would testify to something that is not true. And yet they use these evidences, et cetera. So anyway, I'm starting to sound like a broken record. Welcome. It looks like there's a few folks showing up. I'm doing a special live on uh, Saturday. Yes, Country Western. Good to see you. Welcome. John Rosmarski. Yes. No, no, you're not too late. This is a special session on Saturday morning. So I'm just talking about the uh, Daniel Peterson fireside with which I was able to attend on Zoom. And we have a very, let's hope I, I've got this correct. Uh, we have a very interesting, I'll play this first clip of Daniel Peterson. Uh, I believe this is the one masculine name as well. There's a text found by the Dead Sea at a place called Ein Gedi. Uh, and at Ein Gedi, they found a land deed where Simeon Bar Kokhba, the leader of the second Jewish world in the second century after Christ, uh, was asked, they thought he'd won. He, he did win, eventually he lost. But they thought at that point that he'd won. So he was asked to reconfirm the boundaries of land that people owned. And one of the people for whom he confirmed the dimensions of his property was someone by the name of Alma, son of Judah. So there is that name, again, recorded in the old world. Uh, another thing to do with the word Alma, uh, Alma 710, people have mocked the book of Mormon. So that is the first clip. That was Daniel Peterson's approach to the name Alma. Now, through the years, he has presented this in a different format, very interestingly. And through the years, he has had to, he is forced to change how carefully he words this because he's well aware that this does nothing to authenticate the Book of Mormon. 
And so now he's leaving certain approaches out. He's reworded it so that he can still bring it forward as, look, we have an ancient, authentic male almond name, but notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say this authenticates the Book of Mormon anymore. He says it's just there as an ancient name. See, they're trying hard to make the Book of Mormon appear ancient as if that alone is all you need to do, which I don't think it is at all. It wouldn't matter if the Book of Mormon's ancient. That still wouldn't make it true. But these guys get hung up on the antiquity aspect of it, right? So this theme of Alma, now I've written some things down because I've been doing some research since Thursday night after the fireside got over. I've been furiously working on some, some items for this Sunday, tomorrow night. I'm also going to be showing up. Hey, Steve Harville. Well, welcome from Alabama, Bubba. And Debbie Joe, good morning. Uh, good to see all of you, country western. I did say hi to you, so I just want to say hi to everybody as I can. When Radio Free Mormon asked Daniel Peterson, now the setup has always been that uh, Alma being the male name, of course, everyone knows Alma is the feminine, the female. Uh, there weren't, Joseph Smith did not know any men named Alma. And so for him to put that in the Book of Mormon was a huge hit, a bullseye. This is how they've set it up in the past. You notice Peterson didn't say anything like that, though, in this particular clip. He's being more nuanced because he knows that this does not work. And yet he's consistently still bringing up Alma. This, folks, is what apologetics does. Real scholarship is what I'm going to do for you right here, right now. And I'm going to show you the difference between apologetics and scholarship. And it is critical difference. It is always fatal to apologetics when we do real scholarship. Sincerely. Let me demonstrate that. Here is the deepest irony. When Radio Free Mormon asked him about men named Alma in the United States, in Joseph Smith's day, in the eastern United States, they're found all over Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, Alabama, North Carolina, Connecticut, etc. Peterson came back and he said, well, I don't think that invalidates my saying that Alma is an ancient Hebrew name in the Bar Kokhba documents. So I'm correct. I'm, I'm not lying about this. Uh, I don't think the, the fact that there are men named Alma in the United States uh, does anything to refute Joseph Smith. Because for one thing, I mean, Alma in Alabama, come on, Alma down in Tallahassee, Florida, or wherever he was in Florida, big whoop. Is there anything closer to Joseph Smith physically that would possibly support the contention that he would know men named Alma? That is how Peterson approached it. He said, I am stating the truth, and I will stand by this, that Alma is an ancient Hebrew name found in the Bar Kokhba documents. That is authentic. And therefore, I think that validates Joseph Smith. But the fact is he was shown that there were Almas in the Eastern United States, and he refuses to agree that that invalidates his argument. Of course it does. But his way out, he presumed, was to ask for closer. Well, here we go. Dr. Peterson, once again, let's share this knowledge with you that you know damn well good exists. Here's the scholarship. You can go to familysearch.org. You can enter the search item for a male born in Wayne County, New York, say, or any other nearby town. Here is a list of men named Alma that Joseph Smith easily could have actually known on a real basis in real time. Alma Waters. 
born 1827 in Palmyra, New York. Alma Snyder, born 1822 in Palmyra, New York. Alma C. Messenger, born 186. I said 1862. I think I wrote that down wrong. I might have. I, I don't know. I have to double check. Born in Palmyra. No, that's got to be 1832. Sorry, I wrote that down wrong. Alma Wilson, born 1807 in Palmyra, New York. Alma Warren, born in 1806 in Palmyra, New York. A real interesting one is Alma L. Fuller, born 1816, again, Palmyra, New York, died in 1880 in Providence, Utah. He joined the church in Palmyra and went west with the saints, perhaps, but he was a Mormon. And then Alma Smith, born 1799 in Danby, Rutland, Vermont. Overall, there have been found over 47 men named Alma in the eastern United States in Joseph Smith's day, and we have a list of at least eight of those in Palmyra, New York. That wipes out Daniel Peterson's argument. Joseph Smith had access to men named Alma. That argument no longer is valid. Daniel Peterson knows this. He has been told this by several people. I will say it once again. This is why we do scholarship and not apologetics. At the website Cultural Mormon Cafeteria, Mike Reed found 47 Almas who were men in the 18th and 19th century America. Kevin Barney in the Farms Review, 15, Volume 1 for 2003. I like Kevin Barney. He's a very credible, realistic scholar, even though he does dabble in apologetics, sometimes a little bit too strongly for my taste, but I like him. He's, he's literally good, and he's valid with the information. Well, he's, and, and this is his response to Charles Finney, uh, a more responsible critique. He was honest about noting several Almas as men in Joseph Smith's time and place. So Kevin Barney, uh, you probably should take a lesson from Kevin Barney, Dan Peterson, uh, because your presentation is fatally flawed, literally fatally flawed. How Alma fails from the ancient linguistic evidence also. Now, this is remarkable. Neither papyrology nor linguistics establishes Alma in the Bar Kokhba documents. And yet that is the Mormon apologetic claim. So we're going to take a closer scholarly look, not the apologetics lame duck junk, but the real scholarship on Alma in the Bar Kokhba documents. This is something the Mormon apologists will not do. And that's why I can't trust them. It's that simple. So I use two sources. One is a gentleman named R.T. at Faith Promoting Rumor Blog. He wrote two articles for May 1st, 2014 and May 8th, 2014. And then the other gentleman I'm going to use goes by the name of Symmachus on the Shades Message Board's Mormon Discussion or Discuss Mormonism. I can't remember how. But anyway, Shades Message Board's and Symmachus has completely destroyed the argument for Alma in the Mark Oakman documents. This is huge. This is very, very important to, hey, Steve Harville. Uh, welcome. Looks like there's a few of you here. Oh, Elisa Galeen, how are you? I just barely got started, so you're good. RT says this. He says, the apologetic is Alma, a Hebrew Semitic as the Hebrew noun Elim. 
a young man or a lad with the addition of a hypocharistic A vowel at the end. The unvocalized, I was going to write this out. I apologize. I was going to show you this in the format. Hold on. Let me get some paper real quick because this is really good. This is too good to lose. And uh, I will show you the information because this is actually quite important and it's very, very helpful. I will just draw it as I will just spell it out as I discuss it. I was going to do this ahead of time and I got ahead of myself doing this live session and it's all good. So the, the unvocalized, there's an ion, a lamed, a mem. It's just that simple in Hebrew. I'm just doing the English for now. Aleph, lamed, mem, aleph. Alma is how Yigal Yadin translated that out in the Bar Kokhba documents. So here's the issue, however. The hypocharistic Aleph at the end is a shortening. That comma up above the M there. This is from the Ayan Lamad Mem root. But the name is better explained in the very late cultural and linguistic setting in the Aramaic. Looking at this from the Aramaic now, not the Hebrew, the transliteration is Alim, not Alma. Okay, that's important. Because, and this this Aramaic word means powerful, strong, and uh, the adjectival form is attested in late Aramaic and works well as the predicative element of a personal name. Okay, so, but there is no other evidence that Hebrew, and I'm doing this rather sloppily, but it's big on markers so that you can see it easy. This third one here, I'm going to underline it. The Hebrew elem there. Our problem here is there's no other evidence that this word elem, which means lad or youth, there's no evidence that it actually functioned as a regular predicative element in pre-exilic Israelite personal names. Here comes the problem. We have neither a shortened hypocharistic nor a full form attested here. RT on May 1st, 2014 says, he notes Dan Peterson keeps saying Alma is an authentic Hebrew name, but RT notes the name of the letters of Ayan, Lamed, Mem, and Aleph reflects Aramaic, not Hebrew, and the two are not the same. Yes, they use the same letters. They are not the same language. What we have in Bar Kokhba document is not a Hebrew name Alma. It is an Aramaic word. Very interesting. A, a name, I mean. So Bar Kokhba is seven centuries later than the Book of Mormon Alma, so it's a dubious evidence, of course. That may, that's something the Mormons don't ever tell you either. They don't show you the significance of the dating, which is way off. It's way whacked. Now, on December 7th, 2011, Norman Golb, the great Dead Sea Scroll scholar, says, yes, Yigal Yadin did spell... Yadin did spell Elam here, right there. He did spell it as Alma. 
Norman Golb recognized that and he said, yes, Yadin. And yes, Yadin was a valid uh, scholar, of course, biblical scholar. But the problem is the scientific edition of the Nahal Haver papyri transcribes Alma as, whoops. Now, Yadin published in a scholarly journal, and there's nothing wrong with that for peer review sake, right? We know that's okay. Of course. But it was hasty. It was to hurry and get some new information out. The scientific approach does not give it Alma, but it gives it the Aramaic Alima. Now, this is the official publication from 2003 or 2002. Yes, 2002. Sorry, I've got to keep my facts together because we're doing this from a scholarship, not an apologetic stance. So the alima means the strong one, though the vocalization is uncertain, Golb says, and other Aramaic interpretations of the name are possible, but not Hebrew. So no, according to Norman Golb, actual peer review scholarship, he says this alma does not help the Mormon case for the Book of Mormon name. No joke. And you can find that link to Norman Gold's article, an excellent article uh, on RT's website on Faith Promoting Rumor blog. Now, Simicus on the message boards, this is the one that was really powerful, in my opinion, and I really liked it. Samuel the Lamanite. Yes. Oh, thank you, Samuel. That's very nice. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Max Jenkins. Morning. Good morning. Yeah, this is the mo morning. And Debbie Joe, welcome. And Steve Harvell. Yes, very good. Okay, so Simica says the 1961 publication of Yigal Yadin was a scholarly periodical. And, and it was the Israel Exploration Journal. There's nothing wrong in publishing just as quickly as you can in a scholarly journal to let your colleagues and friends and family know, hey, things are happening. Things are going on. Oh, hey. Hang on just one sec. Hello. What are you doing? Good. This is Radio Free Mormon, you guys. Hold on. Uh, I'm doing a special live session right now. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah. Uh, so I'm on live. I'm on uh, my live session. And uh, oh no, I no no no. You don't have to apologize, Radio Free Mormon. It's all good. I promise. Yes, I am going tomorrow night also on more Book of Mormon archaeology. But yeah, let me call you back after I'm done with this. I'm right in the middle of this. I'm doing the uh, special response to Dan Peterson's fireside on Thursday night, which I was able to attend through the Zoom. And I've taken notes and I've got some clips that I'm showing these guys. So He is. I'm just talking about that right now. Alma is evidence in the book. Can you believe that? I mean, it's just ridiculous apologetics, but yeah, I, and I've already told him, Hey, Radio Free Mormon confronted Dan Peterson years ago on this man. So yeah, you'll get, you'll get a kick out of this session. So, oh no, no, you don't have to apologize, my friend. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you. See ya. Okay, that was my dear friend, Radio Free Mormon. Yeah. So he just wanted to make sure I was on for tomorrow night, and I am. So stay tuned there also. But now to continue with my uh, my scholarly exploration, not the apologetic one. I just know someone else. Yeah, Mike Foxtrot, Foxtrot. Welcome, my friend. Jay Foster, good morning. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, Samuel Lamanite, fantastic to see you. Elisa. Uh, Mark Crispin, yeah, baby. <laughs> so anyway, let me keep going because this is quite important. This is the scholarship of Alma 
from Yigal Yadin and the Bar Kokhba documents. So let's understand the context of Yigal Yadin translating it as Alma. Okay. This is really important. This, the Israel Exploration Journal, which Yadin published in, in 1961. Now, see, this was the area, this was the publication that Hugh Nibley brought it out. And he did his review of the Bar Kokhba documents in the BYU studies. And this is the source that Nibley used. And then, of course, all the other apologists have simply inbred scholarship copied Nibley, right? So, because of course it's a bullseye for Joseph Smith. So they declare, but they're wrong. So this is a text. It is not a definitive edition, which was meticulously edited by papyrologists and epigraphers. Yadin's work. Let's understand this. This is important. It doesn't mean he's wrong in this case, unfortunately. He is wrong. So before 2002, this is remarkable, other scholarly articles talking about Yadin's translation and text call it an unpublished text. And yet he describes this in the Palestinian or the Israel Exploration Journal. But it is noted as an unpublished text. This is really important. It had not been scientifically edited yet, and this is the version, the pre-scientific edited version of Yadin, which Mormon apologists continue and fatally wrongly to use, which is very important. So they're relying on this for their bullseye is apologetics, but it's not scholarship. So the first scholarly edition now was published in 2002 of all of the materials in the Bar Kokhba caves when they were discovered, all of them. And this includes the Greek, the Nabataean, the Hebrew, the Aramaic See, there's a lot more here than just one Hebrew name, Alma, in a document, right? So this is a multilinguistic, multicultural cache of archaeological found documents, and that is its proper context, okay? This is important. Yadin simply took the name... Ayin Lamed Mem, the root, and added the hypocharistic Aleph at the end to give us Alma, the Hebrew Alma. And that's how Alma came about to be in the Bar Kokhba documents, and it's wrong. That's something you'll never hear Mormon apologists say. That's really interesting, isn't it? So Hugh Nibley jumped on this, as does Daniel C. Peterson. Once again, just last Thursday, mentioned it again. They think it validates the Book of Mormon ancient authenticity. Rather than rely on the most up-to-date edition of the text, Mormon apologists use the rushed and tentative transcription from 60 years ago. Yeah. Apologetics. This is not the evidence that apologists pretend it is. Not by a long shot. So, the Aleph at the end, you have the uh, you have the Ayin, which is like the comma. Then you have the Lamed, which in Hebrew looks like that, or Aramaic. And then the mem, like that. And I'm I'm drawing it wrong. And then the other comma at the end of the M is the olive that Yadin put 
into his translation to come up with Alma, right? However, the problem is this Aleph at the end of the word shows that it's Aramaic, not Hebrew. And this is really interesting because Aleph, instead of the ah ending, is the common form in this period in a name. The ah ending is not used. The Aleph is in this period, in Bar Kokhba's day. So the ending in Aramaic indicates a certain grammatical state of the noun. And more and more in this period, it's just becoming the normal ending on masculine nouns. Feminines have the ending of T, and this is true in Hebrew. Now it's becoming more true in Aramaic in this time period. This is the T before the Aleph. So this shows the name is Aramaic. It's not Hebrew at all. And Alima, now this Alima is that, and Yadin gave it that also. So here's the Alima here. This is the Aramaic, but it comes from this form. The Ayin, Lamed, Mem, and Aleph. But Alma also was used by Yadin, and that is the basis of the lettering. However, the issue is LM, uh, Ayin, Lamed, Mem, is also found in Jastro's dictionary of the Aramaic of all of the inscriptions and the papyrological evidence that we had up to 1900. And what we find in the Bar Kokhba document is the Aramaic ending of the masculine nouns. That's in the dictionary of Jastrow. Now, this is important. An Aramaic first name of the son of a gentleman, of a man, with a traditional Jewish name, Yehuda, in the Bar Kokhba documents. Alma ben Yehud is the, the language that Yadin was translating, but that's a combination of the Aramaic and the Hebrew. However, just in this time period, this fits the multilinguistic context of second century Palestine, Judea, perfectly. So it makes much better sense that this is an Aramaic name, not a Hebrew. According to the linguistic and papyrological and epigraphic materials, which we have now, based on the scientific study in 2002, 40 years later after Yadin, it took them 40 years to really put this together. And Mormons won't touch this updated version of 2002. They stick with the old, quick, dashed off translation, which is false. Amazing. Isn't it? That's apologetics. We're doing the scholarship today. Well, why would an Aramaic name show up among a group of exiles from the 7th century Judah? Now, here's the other angle that Symmachus points out. Aramaic later became the mother tongue of most of the Jews in Palestine, of course, but that was only after the Babylonian conquest. The Babylon to which most of the deportees were taken was heavily Aramaic speaking. Ah, there's the connection. We know from the Bible that as recently as the time of Hezekiah, that's a hundred years after Lehi now, that the Judeans couldn't understand Aramaic since they still spoke Hebrew. So if apologists are right, we have here to believe yet another absurdity. Not only did Lehi and his family speak Aramaic, but they kept the language up sufficiently to have it influence their naming practices, as well as Egyptian, Hebrew, Arabic, and Greek, not to mention Uto-Aztecan. <laughs> 
the kind of a multilingualism that the apologetics imply simply did not occur with that sort of intensity in Lehi's day. So from both angles, the modern scholarship updated scientific analysis of the Nahal Haver expedition published in 2002, and basically agree, accepting the apologetic stance and looking back, the, looking back at the historical circumstances of Lehi's day, this simply is not a Hebrew name, Alma, for a man. It's just not. It does not carry conviction. And that's why I wanted to do this special session live with you. That is important. However, there is another issue that I would like to share a, another brief clip of Daniel Peterson. Come on, come on. Okay, let's see if I can do this one. Let me see if you can hear this close enough. Hey, Radio Free Mormon, welcome, my friend. Here's another clip of another subject of Dan Peterson that I wanted to at least just touch bases on. Now, mind you, he just gave this two days ago, 2022. He's still talking about this. Oh, this is the part where sometimes my wife describes an urban city society in the new world. Quite unlike, quite unlike the Indians around Joseph Smith. I say unabashedly, I'm a, I'm a Mesoamerican. Some people are not, but that's where I think the Book of Mormon happened. Um, but you don't have to believe that to be saved. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> something else. It doesn't matter. Uh, keep going. <laughs> You've got a few more points to make. I have a few more points. But this is the point where sometimes my wife is out in the audience going, <laughs> Stop. We're saying go, go, go. <laughs> and we're closer. Well, okay. Uh, well, I used to say, look, I'm the one with the mic. You're not. So tough luck. Um, <laughs> but uh, Joseph was delighted when he read a book called uh, Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, written by John Lloyd Stevens, which was published about a decade after the book Mormon appeared. And he discovered that there were cities in Central America that were fortified with ditches and walls and palisades of logs and houses and cities of cement. This is exactly what the Book of Mormon had described, and he was delighted to see it. It's an area, by the way, where we know there was writing. And that isn't true in all areas of the, of the uh, ancient Mesoamerican or even pre, pre-Columbian American world. Uh, I won't go into that, but, uh, but we do know that there was writing and we do know that there were writing systems that used timekeeping systems. One of them is really interesting. Yeah, I didn't want to get into the timekeeping at this point. Notice what he's saying about the concept of Joseph Smith agreeing that the Book of Mormon has a Mesoamerican setting in 1840 when he ran across Stevens, John Lloyd Stevens' book. What Peterson does not acknowledge here is that Joseph Smith and all of the early Mormon brethren, absolutely before 1840, Joseph Smith was constantly receiving revelations from Jesus Christ, telling certain of his followers, say Orson Pratt or Parley Pratt, uh, Orson Hyde, whoever, Brigham Young, it didn't matter who, Heber C. Kimball, whichever, to go on missions to the Lamanites in Nebraska, in Ohio, in Missouri, etc. The missions to the Lamanites, the borders of the Lamanites were in the United States, North America, for the first 10 years of the Book of Mormon's existence in Joseph Smith's mind and in all the early brethren's mind. Zelf the white Lamanite, on that expedition that they found that great big Zelf and Onandagus, his father or the great chief, whoever it was, the white Lamanite, 
they were in the United States. They weren't down there in Central America. Joseph Smith was identifying actual bones and ruins in North America with the Lamanites. So Daniel Peterson, of course, ignores all of that, or else he attempts to recontext that so that he can make a Mesoamerican model, because he's he's in favor of John Sorensen's interpretation and view. But they don't take into the full account of all the information, and they change it up. And so again, it's a uh, it's a very lopsided affair. It's a situation where uh, the apologists don't have enough of a leg to stand on. Now, let me share yet another quick clip, if I may. Hopefully, I get this right. I did that one and that one and that one. Oh, yeah, this this one is too good to lose to. And uh, it, this one's a couple of minutes, but the first part of it is not the context. It gives you the context, but it's the second part of this video clip that I wanted to just briefly touch upon. So here we go. Down into the area just behind Yemen. And then going behind the mountains of Yemen across what's called the empty quarter, a really terrible area, across to a land of bountiful. Um, now, that... That change in course is a place that the Book of Mormon calls Udeno, which is really interesting. It's related probably to a Hebrew and Semitic root, which means to mourn and to sigh. That's where Ishmael dies and is buried. So it's appropriate. It's interesting that the uh, the name is not already there. Uh, excuse me, it is already there that, that Lehi uh, recognizes the name. The other places he names the Valley of Lemuel. You know, that sort of thing. But when he gets there, it says the name of the place was called Nahum. It had already been there. And we now know that it was already there at his time. Uh, this is really interesting to me because the change has happened in my lifetime in recent memory. For a while, I argued that, well, the name is really old. It's already there in Arabia. We can find it going back to 900 AD. We've, we had manuscripts that went back to that period and talked about an area in exactly the right spot called Nahum which is, is the right name. You understand that in Semitic languages, the vowels change, but the consonants, in this case, NHM, remain. Um, but 900 AD was the furthest back we could go, as far as I could tell. And it's 1,500 years removed from Lehi. That's the best we can do. It's striking that it's even there. But then this altarpiece was found. Now a couple of others have been located. And this one was dedicated by a man called Beathar the Nehemite. And it's dated by, thankfully, a German non-LDS archaeological uh, expedition. It's dated to 600 BC. So we now know that, that name Nehem was there in that area at exactly the time for Lehi to come through and recognize the name of the place. And it goes due east from there and reaches a place on the coast of the Arabian Sea that uh, I think is Wadi Saik. Now, there are some other places that people have proposed. So far, this is the one that I find convincing. And it shocks people because they say there was no bountiful place in the Arabian Peninsula. It's all nothing but standards, which is... Anyway, I wanted to get to the fact that Daniel Peterson is still touting Nahum as a direct archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon. And any of those any of you who knows the famous debate of Phil Jenkins and Bill Hamblin and Phil Jenkins, the Nahum Follies generated an enormous amount of discussion all over the internet, the LDS blogger knackles, the LDS apologist fair and Jeff Lindsay, all of those people just went blitzoid about Phil Jenkins refuting Nahum. And Bill Hamblin tried to debate him, and he trashed Bill Hamblin. This is what else I will talk about tomorrow night also in more detail, uh, as well as one, uh, one or two other Mesoamerican archaeological evidences for the Book of Mormon that Bill Hamblin threw at Phil Jenkins, and Phil Jenkins, in a proper spirit of peer review, completely annihilated those evidences that the apologists have been telling the Mormon people, the chapel Mormons, 
so that they can build up their faith. They are saying there's more and more Mesoamerican actual names of people and kings that are fitting the Book of Mormon, and that is simply apologetic silliness. It's false. It has, It is false. And we will discuss the scholarship tomorrow night. I will discuss that tomorrow night on my live session. But uh, again, true to form for the apologetics, uh, Dan Peterson knows Nahum is not valid. He absolutely knows it's not valid. He has been told. He has been talking to. If that was valid, why on earth would they put that in just Mormon-created journals of scholarship, supposed scholarship? They would have spread this to the world. They themselves would have gone to the Israel Exploration Journal and published it there because it is in the Middle East, right? It's on the Arabian Peninsula. Mormons can't get it published. Why? Because the peer review has demonstrated that it's all wishful thinking. There is no Nahum there as the Book of Mormon would present it. That is the issue. So, so I wanted to cover that. And then there is one more item that I do want to get to. Uh, one more clip of Daniel Peterson. And this is a really important uh, point also. Uh, let me play the clip, and then I will discuss this also. I want you to pay attention to how he does not name the scholars involved in confirming what he's about to tell you. They remain anonymous. And that is my critique. So watch this. He has published the most complete dictionary I ever published of the Utah Aztec and language family, which I admit is a very small field, but he's one of the pillars in it. Well, he's a Latter-day Saint. And so one of the things that caught his interest was what he calls Uto-Aztecan, excuse me, the Semitic and Egyptian elements in Uto-Aztecan. More and more, he noticed that there were words in the Uto-Aztecan language family that resembled Hebrew, Aramaic, and Egyptian words. And it's not just enough to find things that look alike. That can be done with any languages. There are always coincidental uh, resemblances between languages. But he developed a system for predicting in advance how a Semitic root, a Hebrew or Aramaic root, would turn into a Nahuatl word and found over and over again his predictions were confirmed. Uh, and, and I have a couple of friends. I thought, well, this is not my field. I don't know this stuff well, so I can't speak on it. But I have a couple of friends who both have PhDs in Native American languages. One of them from Harvard is a specialist in Mayan. And another of his specialty is Udo Aztecan. And they both told me that, uh, that when they first heard of Brian Stubbs' thesis, they got eh, crackpot stuff. But the more they looked at it, they said, this is actually really solid. He's got not just hundreds, but several thousand examples of words that seem to indicate, as he would put it, um, the infusion of Semitic languages, those languages from the Middle East and Egyptian word elements into the Americas sometime in ancient times, before the time of Christ, because it's in all the languages that they, as they fanned out, those words show up in all the languages, which diverged quite a while ago. Um, so it must have been very early. Now that doesn't prove the Book of Mormon directly, but I'll tell you, I've got a good thesis about how Hebrew and Egyptian words might have made it to the new world in ancient times. <laughs> and so does Brian. He doesn't make the connection in his main book on Udo Aztecan uh, Hebrew and Semitic elements and the Egyptian elements in Udo Aztecan, but he's quite willing to tell you what he thinks, that he thinks he's found evidence of precisely that kind of infusion. So people raise the DNA issue. There is a language DNA as well, and the language DNA seems to show that there was a migration of people from the Middle East, specifically the Levant, the area of modern day Israel, and uh, and Egypt sometime in antiquity and affected these languages. It didn't give rise to them. It affected them. Now, I'm not sure about you guys, but number one, if there were scholars 
who actually found the Uto Aztecan uh, having Egyptian, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Middle East elements in it, that would make world views. That would make world news. That would make world history. And notice his claim. And the reason I wanted to share this clip is because now I'm not going to be accused of putting words in his mouth. He says the linguistic DNA footprint shows that there are language migrations from the Middle East. So far as I am aware, Michael Coe certainly wouldn't agree with that. I, I shared some ideas on Michael Coe a couple of weeks ago from John DeLynn's Mormon Stories interview. Uh, the influence came from Asia, not the Middle East. So far as I know, the only people who are claiming Middle East language linguistic uh, evidences in the Uto Aztecan are Mormons. Now, he is right. Brian Stubbs has spent a lifetime of study on that. He's certainly more expert than I will ever be or that I care to be. But this has not made a dent in the world scholarship of linguistic analysis and languages. Uh, we don't find it in any kind of epigraphy. Uh, in Mesoamerica whatsoever that we're aware of. Nobody has agreed with this yet. In fact, it's basically a non-starter. Uh, it's kind of like Royal Scouse and finding early modern English in the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon. I mean, the significance of language, weird, archaic grammar being found in the 14th and 15th centuries in the Book of Mormon. And Peterson does talk about that in this fireside. He says, well, I don't know what to make of it, but it's there. It's archaic grammar from the 1400s and 1500s. I mean, but he doesn't say anything about it authenticating the Book of Mormon. Uh, so I don't even know why he brought it up. <laughs> it doesn't do a damn thing for the book and its authenticity. In fact, it adds wrinkles like crazy. What is it, like a ghost committee from Renaissance times inspiring Joseph Smith and the Seer Stone? I mean, the whole the whole thing seems just ludicrous, and they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I heard over $300,000 on the critical text of the Book of Mormon by Skousen, uh program. and. My goodness, that's a boatload of money just to come to that conclusion. That, oh, yeah, the language dates back to 1400 AD. How does that authenticate anything? It doesn't. But at least it wasn't Joseph Smith doing it. You see, this, to me personally, this shows the pure desperation of the apologetic enterprise. It's staggering. It's amazing. So this is the, oh, hey, Richard. Petchak, welcome. Uh, I, I I just wanted to share, uh, Debbie Joe. Oh, T.O., hey, T.O., by the way, I did get my latest on uh, Uzdavanis, the uh, philosophy as a rite of rebirth, and I've started reading it. Uh, we definitely need to talk, my friend. No kidding. Uh, Uzdavnis is incredible. I'm just letting you know, I, I have taken your advice. I have about five of his books now and I'm reading in all of them right now. So thank you for the recommendation to get his book. And, uh, I would recommend everybody get those books. So anyway, I've got one over here right now, right now, this, uh, <clears throat> this one, the golden chain by Uzdavnis, man, that's a sensational book. Platonic and Pythagorean conceptualizations of the essence of what philosophy is all about. This is spectacular. Uh, philosophy is not our modern day philosophy, of course, has fallen off the bandwagon. They they're lost. So Uzdavnis is a good corrective for that, as far as I'm concerned. And I will be doing a lot of videos on that. So anyway, you guys, look, I've been about an hour or so. It is Saturday. Oh, thank you for all your generosity and thanks for showing up and and Gabin, uh, appreciate everybody uh, sharing your ideas, et cetera. So I just wanted to let you know from a former apologetic viewpoint, why did I not find all of these evidences for the Book of Mormon convincing? 
from Dan Peterson's Calgary Fireside on Thursday night, July 14th, 2022. Because Phil Jenkins has taken it to the heart of the matter in his debate with Bill Hamblin. Until there is a legitimate ground reality understood and acknowledged by the peer reviews of the archaeologists, the ethnographers, the geologists, the geographers, the epigraphers, the papyrologists, the Mesoamerican archaeologists, the historians, until there is actually a realistic, legitimate basis, not just a philosophical or a parallel basis for the existence of the Nephite nation and the Lamanite nation, until we have a ground reality, nothing else actually matters. And this is why I, I just, I do not, I don't fault Dan Peterson for trying. It's all good, but I just don't find it persuasive. For one, this evidence is 30 years old plus. There is no current Mormon research, Book of Mormon research, that is validating the Book of Mormon whatsoever uh, that I'm aware of, that I've seen. Uh, Peterson has to really stretch the issue and go back and find materials that are 35, 40 years old and then bring them all the way up to, what, 15, 20 years old. Not much has changed. They're still just taking a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here and a little bit there, you know. He says the basic chronological uh, interpretations of the Olmecs in relation to the Mayans basically, in a general way, a generic blasé way, fits the chronological issue of the Jaredites in relation to the Nephites. Folks, that's not evidence. That's not evidence. That's guess. That's guesswork. That's apologetics. There is no Nephites or Lamanites anywhere in Mesoamerica. We have no actual artifacts from the civilization to look at like we do in the ancient Near East. We know the Nabataeans were real. We've got the archaeological materials. We know the ancient Jews were real. For one thing, we have the Bar Kokhba documents, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Uh, we know the early Christians were real. We have the Gnostic materials, right? So we, we have all this stuff for actual, you know, we know the Vikings came to North America uh, because we can find their, look, the, the Book of Mormon description of the size of the populations of these nations, these Nephites, these Lamanites, in the end, in their wars, they equaled millions. At the end of the Jaredite collapse of their civilization, a thousand years earlier than the Nephites, they were here for a thousand years. The end result was millions of people killed in both cases. That size of a population leaves a footprint in the archaeological record. We find nothing. We, we absolutely are at nothing yet. Uh, so until we can get that basis. All of these wonderful parallels and ideas and linguistic stuff, you know, and, ooh, there's an archaeology. Well, there's an overall generalized version of their mathematics, say, or a generalized version of them being urban dwellers, things like that. All of that's fluff. Unfortunately, it, it can't be bona fide evidence if you can't specifically tie it to the culture, to the civilization. And apologetics has been unable to do that. And, and now the Mesoamerican faction is fighting like crazy with the Heartland faction, whom they say things happened in the Book of Mormon in New York and the Great Lakes region, et cetera, the Finger Lakes up there north of New York, et cetera, along the Mississippi River and all those areas. This, well, that's where, that's where Joseph Smith found Zelf the White Lamanite, right?
right? You know, the Heartlanders have that going for them and the mission Lamanites in the United States, but none of that has panned out. Millions of people are said to have died on Hill Cumora with metal swords, breastplates, helmets, etc. Not all that stuff just rusts and goes away. And yeah, people say, well, do you think the remaining inhabitants would just let it sit there? That might be a valid point, but there's always something left that the archaeological record can discover. We have nothing. We have nothing. LIDAR radar is solving the problem of the forest canopies and rainforest in Mesoamerica. We find nothing of Nephite and Lamanite. They're ju it's just not there. So, yeah, the, the faith-promoting aspect of the apologetics just lacks conviction. I, I'm still not going to go back to church and become an apologist again based on this information that Daniel Peterson shared simply because it has no stick to itiveness. That's how it works. I, it just doesn't convince me. So uh, that is my, you betcha. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate y'all showing up. I am going to take off. I've got a Saturday. To, I got to go prepare for tomorrow night too. So I, I have some fun stuff I want to go do today and get done. And then tomorrow night I will uh, show back up here at six o'clock with all you guys. Come on back. Oh, thank you, Debbie Joe. That's very generous of you. I appreciate that. You are a sweetheart. You're awesome. And uh, Alisa, good to see you. And John Russ Barsky. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to head out and I will see you guys tomorrow night, six o'clock. Uh, I hope you have a great day. Be safe. Be good. Stay out of the heat. If you're in the heat and I'm going to go. So I've got to go tend to my garden. Yes. I'm, Ooh, I'm getting some beautiful vegetables. So I'll see you guys tomorrow night. Love y'all. See you later. Fun stuff. <laughs>